Next, we're going to move on to talk about the L2-induced norm, which is also referred to as the H-infinity norm, the Hardy space of functions. So H stands for the Hardy space of functions infi infinite. So um, the infinite norm usually is the, the largest magnitude over the entire domain. And so, so the H here corresponds to uh, what's called a Hardy space. So that's a space of functions. I'm not going to go into the details of Hardy spaces. Um, we've talked about ba Banach spaces, but the, the, we don't need to go into the Hardy spaces really, except to mention that that's what the H comes from. So basically, if we were to plot the singular values of the transfer function as a function of the frequency, okay? So in MATLAB, you can use the command sigma that will do a singular value plot. So it'll plot the singular values of a transfer function, and then you just look for the peak magnitude and that over all frequencies, and that is the um, that is the H infinity norm. So there are other methods of computing the H infinity norm, but in general, it's a complicated thing to calculate. And so I'm going to talk about a number of methods for calculating the H infinity norm. None of them actually gives you the H infinity norm. All of the the methods that we have basically provide bounds on the H infinity norm and we can tighten those bounds as tight as we want to get but it doesn't give us the exact value so the first method uses something called a, a, a Hamiltonian matrix so this is the Hamiltonian matrix okay and we notice that it is a function of gamma okay and it has it involves the ABCD matrices so here I'm assuming that my system has ABC matrices and that D is 0 this matrix is of dimension 2n by 2n, okay? And it's, it's a Hamiltonian matrix. It turns out uh, a matrix is Hamiltonian if it satisfies this property. That is, if we define, if we take a similarity transformation on it, we get minus the matrix transposed. So this, this shows that it's similar to a skew symmetric matrix, okay? So J here is this matrix. The similarity transformation is just this, okay? And so if a matrix satisfies these properties, it is a Hamiltonian matrix. So a Hamiltonian matrix is special in that it has a symmetric spectrum. That is, if I take the determinant of SI minus the matrix, it turns out to be equal to SI plus the matrix. So that's where the symmetry comes in. Whether you use plus or minus, you get the same characteristic polynomial okay and basically what this means is that you have what's called a symmetric spectrum that that is the the poles if you plot them on a pole zero map the poles are symmetric with respect to both the real and the imaginary axes okay so if i have a complex pole i have its conjugate but then i also have its mirror image on the other side of the imaginary axis okay so so that's that's what this is. Okay, I'm also going to define this quantity. Here, the phi is not the state transition matrix. It's just this quantity, gamma squared i minus this. Now, notice I have minus s and s. If s is equal to j omega, that is on the stability boundary, then h transpose of minus s, this is actually the complex conjugate transpose of this. So this is like is like you're setting yourself up to do a singular value decomposition calculation. So it turns out that since this is a transfer function, a transfer function has a state space, right? This quantity is a function of s. We can show that it has a state space model represented here, okay? So, and if we take the inverse of this quantity, we can show that m gamma actually appears in this function. That is, and so an important question is, so what? Okay, well, it, it just shows where the, simpl where the Hamiltonian matrix appears in all of this stuff. Okay, so recall that the two norm is basically the supremum over all omega of the largest singular value of H, which is the largest eigenvalue in magnitude of, of the ma uh, H transpose H or H adjoint H. Okay, so that's what the H infinity norm is defined to be. But the H infinity norm is less than some number gamma squared. 
or the h infinity norm squared is less than gamma squared if and only if this quantity is satisfied so the, for all omega okay so what so this is like the calculation we would use to do this the largest singular value but now i have this semi this uh, this matrix inequality and what this is saying is that gamma squared is greater than the largest singular value I'm, or rather la largest singular value squared so if i take this now over to the other side i get the phi and so basically phi of j omega so so basically the phi that we saw is related to h this way so it's related to the h infinity norm and it's related to the hamiltonian matrix so there that's where all the connections come in so we have this theorem that says the infinity h infinity norm of a transfer function is less than gamma and that these are all equivalent to one another this matrix phi evaluated at j omega is positive definite for all omega the matrix so that so these two are equivalent to one another this is equivalent to the fact that the matrix m gamma has no purely imaginary eigenvalues okay so so we saw how m gamma is, was related to phi inverse and so it turns out that that there's a relationship there and finally we have this linear matrix inequality there exists x positive definite such that this quantity is strictly negative definite so we saw something like this before with the uh, Lyapunov function. That is, we had x positive definite, a transpose x plus x a negative definite. So we just had that portion, and that was enough to guarantee stability. So this tells us not only must the system be stable, but there, there's more to it. Okay, and so that's where the, the c and the b come in and so forth. So this is... Uh, a linear matrix inequality, and we'll be seeing some more of those as we go along. Um, but these are this theorem gives us some tools for computing the h infinity norm. The, the, again, the theorem doesn't tell us exactly how to compute the value of the norm; just tells us an upper bound. The upper bounding of the norm. So, so this is an upper bound, and so as for any gamma that's greater than h infinity norm, this matrix has no purely imaginary eigenvalues. Okay, so if I pick a value of gamma and this matrix has purely imaginary eigenvalues, that means gamma is is less than or equal to the h infinity norm. So, so if we pick a value of gamma, we can check this quantity, and this this will tell us either gamma is greater than the h infinity norm or gamma is less than or equal to the h infinity norm. So we know one way or the other. Okay, and so. Um, we saw that the upper bounding is equivalent to a frequency domain inequality. That's the phi. The upper bounding is related to the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian matrix, and the upper bound is related to linear matrix inequalities. So the thing about linear matrix inequalities is that there are uh, efficient solvers to check to see if a if there exists an X that satisfies a kind of linear matrix inequality like that. All right. So we can't readily compute the value, but we can test if a value is above or below the true value. So an, an algorithm that uses the Hamiltonian matrix goes like this. We find initial values for upper and lower bounds on the H infinity norm. So um, we can find a lower bound by just evaluating the, the transfer function at any value of omega. That will give us a lower bound. To pick an upper bound, uh, it's not so easy. I'll, I'll talk about how to find an upper bound in just a bit. Then we would use a bisection approach to narrow the range between the upper bounds until the difference between the upper bounds and the lower bounds is within the desired tolerance, and then we would stop. So how do we first find that upper bound? Well, we use something called a doubling algorithm to find the initial upper bound. So we would choose as an initial upper bound, so gamma subscript u corresponds to the upper bound on gamma, and we would choose it to be the large, two times the largest singular value of the transfer function evaluated at dc. And that is frequency j is equal to zero, j omega, omega is equal to zero. That corresponds to dc. So we choose as our upper bound twice 
the DC gain of our system. Okay, Then we would use that value to compute the eigenvalues of M gamma, and we would check. If M gamma has purely imaginary eigenvalues, that means this is not an upper bound. It's actually a lower bound. And so we can actually set that to be a lower bound. So gamma little l corresponds to the lower bound is now this value. And we, we reset gamma upper bound to be twice that value. Okay, so we started off with this value. We've now doubled it. Okay, and so we would basically re repeat steps two through three until ma the matrix M gamma U has no purely imaginary eigenvalues. So we just keep increasing the gamma until the matrix no longer has purely imaginary eigenvalues. And if a system is stable, it, there will always come a point in which there will be uh, a gamma that, such that the matrix has no purely imaginary eigenvalues. In which case, an inip, initial upper bound then is, is the value for which that occurs. So this process also gives us an initial value for lower bound. Okay, so this this is the approach. That we, so we would choose an initial upper bound. If that upper bound actually is an upper bound, then we can just start there and we can choose as a lower bound zero. Okay, so the infinity norm cannot be less than zero. So that does class satisfy the the uh, idea of a lower bound. So we would start at lower bound is equal to zero and the upper bound given by this quantity. So now we know how to find upper and lower bounds to start with. Okay, so the bisection algorithm, we find gamma, we're looking for gamma upper bound star, so such that we have this, but it's very, very close, a very tight inequality. So we would start with our upper and lower bounds and choose gamma some halfway in between. We'd compute the eigenvalues for that value of gamma eigenvalues of M. If M has purely imaginary eigenvalues, then the gamma that you have is actually a lower bound, and so we set that to be the lower bound. Otherwise, if gamma, if M gamma does not have purely imaginary eigenvalues, then we can choose that as an upper bound. So you're either moving the upper, so you have an upper bound and a lower bound. Then you, you choose a value in the middle. And, and so that new value either becomes the new upper bound or it becomes the new lower bound okay and so each time you go through this iteration you decrease the uncertainty so the uncertainty region that you have each time it gets cut in half okay so and and until you get the upper and lower bound tolerances really close to one another so then you know the H infinity norm is somewhere in between them, and if you're really close, then you know you have pretty good confidence as to the, what the value is. Now, the, the formula that I showed you for M gamma assumed that D was not zero. What happens if, if D was equal to zero? What happens if D is not zero? Then this is our transfer function. We define this quantity R as this, and it turns out that gamma needs to make this positive definite or else we will automatically not have our new Hamiltonian matrix will not be uh, will will have eigenvalues on the imaginary uh, on the units on the imaginary axis. So here's our new Hamiltonian matrix. You can see it's pretty complicated, and it involves our inverse. So this better be positive definite, or I can't take the inverse of it in, in all of this as well. So we automatically know a lower bound on the gamma, and it's the largest singular value of d transpo uh, of, of d, the largest singular value squared of d. So, when d is not zero, we have this situation: the h infinity norm is less than gamma. That's equivalent to r being positive definite and m gamma having no purely imaginary eigenvalues, or there exists an, an x positive definite and this linear matrix inequality that must be satisfied. So notice this. Notice that it's become more complicated because of the d. The d appears in a number of places, but it's just a linear matrix inequality. Linear in the sense that wherever I see x, x is just multiplied by a constant matrix. Okay. So as a variable, the variable only appears linearly in this matrix. So even though it appears in different terms, it appears linearly. So for a fixed value of gamma, I can I can 
this this is just a linear matrix inequality it turns out I can rewrite this linear matrix inequality to simplify it or at least make it look more simple and and I can now work with this linear matrix inequality X is positive definite and I have this matrix must be negative definite so so notice that instead of having the, the D's multiplied by stuff like here and this R I actually don't have the R appearing in, in any of this. So it's kind of, so this is actually equivalent to this linear matrix inequality using a short complement. Okay, so if I, if I take this quantity here and um, I, can, I can reduce this whole process by, by uh, taking a short complement that involves this block down here. So this is the co computation of the H infinity norm, which is again the L2 induced norm. Now for the little L2 induced norm, we have the problem in discrete time. In discrete time, we saw that the H infinity norm was the maximum over all Z of magnitude one of the largest singular value of H of Z. Okay, And in the same way that in continuous time, we had a Hamiltonian matrix, in discrete time, we have a symplectic matrix. So here's the form of the symplectic matrix, and it requires, at least this matrix requires, that the determinant of A be non-zero. Turns out you can still solve this problem if the determinant of A is equal to zero, but it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, And so the reason the inverse is needed is because I have this A here, and I'm taking the, trans the inverse transpose of this matrix. So it's a little complicated. I can actually multiply this all out for you and you get this really hairy looking thing. It, it actually is much simpler looking if you have it in this form. So this is the symplectic matrix. And just like we had a theorem in continuous time for the computation or the or, or relationships between the H infinity norm and other things, we have this one here. The inf H infinity norm is less than gamma. The symplectic matrix, S of gamma has no eigenvalues on the unit circle. So instead of the imaginary axis, in discrete time we have the unit circle, so we have a similar kind of situation. And we also have now, um, there exists x positive definite and this um, linear matrix inequality. So again, this is linear in x. And it's it has a very interesting structure in that this matrix, if if X is positive definite, then this matrix is positive definite. And this gives us something like a Lyapunov function, right? A transpose XA minus something like X. That's like a Lyapunov function, but it's different in the sense that now it's not just the A, it's the entire system matrix that's being st stuck in here. So it, it turns out that what happens is not only must the state de decrease, but there's a sense in which the transfer function must also decrease. Okay, the, the, that's called a contractive system, and and that's equivalent to having a discrete time transfer function less than uh, h infinity norm less than gamma. So this is kind of an interesting thing, and it turns out that it's really simple to. to uh, this is fairly simple to look at in terms of linear matrix inequalities, but actually to derive this linear matrix inequality is non-trivial, non-trivial. So anyway, this is the discrete time H infinity norm. And so we've looked at now continuous time and discrete time. Stay tuned and we'll talk about other induced system norms.